Hello, everyone, and um, <clears throat> thanks a lot for attending this talk, Building Adaptive Systems for Fast Flow of Change. And thanks a lot for the intro, David. So let's um, travel through time and let's look at how the market shares of mobile phones providers have evolved over the years from 2005 to 2017. As you could see at the end of the clip, um, Nokia disappeared from the market. Within only six years, Nokia's market share has dropped by more than 90%. And this is kind of stunning if you consider that Nokia released its first smartphone related N-series in 2005, two years before Apple came out with their first iPhone. So why did Nokia encounter such a massive loss of market share? And one of the reasons is, um, with more competitors turning up, targeting the smartphone market, uh, the landscape has changed. So software on mobile phones became more important. And Nokia was, at its heart, rather a hardware company than a software company. And they totally underestimated the increasing importance of software. Also, another reason of Nokia's decline was their inertia to change created by past success. Even though they introduced the smartphone N series in 2005 and were very innovative, they were still so successful with their old cell phone model that they were very reluctant to fully transition to the smartphone era. So in a world of constant and rapid flow of changes and increasing uncertainties, organizations have to continuously adapt and evolve to remain competitive and excel in the market. To tackle the challenge, um, building adaptive system in such a dynamic lens, business landscape, I would like to combine three perspectives of business strategy with Wadley Maps, software architecture and design uh, with domain-driven design, and team organization with team topologies. And we will start with the business strategy with Wadley Maps. So according to Simon Wadley, uh, the creator of Wadley Maps and a researcher from the UK, he, the process of making business decision is based on a strategy cycle. And uh, the strategy cycle is a representation of change and how we need to react to it. So it starts with a purpose, um, the why of our business. Why are we doing what we are doing? And then it comes to the landscape. So the landscape is a description of the um, competitive environment we as a business are situating in. And this landscape is represented with a map, the Wadley map. So a Wadley map is a representation of the landscape in which a business is operating in. And this Wadley map visualizes the evolution of a value chain. Behind every user, there is a value chain. So it starts off with the first questions, um, like who are your users, who's expecting something from you, and who, who's asking for help? And what are the user needs? So what, of kind of, what kind of problems they would like to get solved by you? And so the user needs, they are the anchor of our map. And what are the components and activities that are necessary to fulfill these user needs, either directly or indirectly by facilitating other components and activities in this value chain? And how do these components depend on each other and what position do they have in this value chain? So at the top, we have those things that are visible where the users are touching your system. And at the bottom, it gets more and more invisible to the user. Now each component of this value chain is going to be plotted along an evolution axis going from left to right. So at the left, we have Genesis with brand new things that have never existed before, then custom build, then product and rental, such as off the shelf products or open source software, and then things on the right like commodity and utilities. And the movement of a component along this X axis is determined by its stage of evolution. 
The next step of the strategy cycle are the climatic patterns. Uh, the climatic patterns describe the external forces and rules that are influencing and acting on the landscape, over which we have no control. And understanding the climatic patterns allows us to see how the landscape is changing. And some of them can be anticipated. That means we can prepare for them. And this gives us strategic advantage to our competitors. So let's look at some climatic patterns that are affecting our landscape. Uh, one pattern is that the map is never static, but very dynamic. So everything evolves from left to right through the forces of demand and supply competition. And as the components evolve, their characteristic change from an uncharted domain, the uncertain, rare, constantly changing and predicted domain and becoming more industrialized, the known, the common, the stable, um, the commonly understood ordered domain on the right. Another um, climatic pattern is um, that efficiency, efficiency enables innovation. So the industrialization of one component enables for example, new features for existing products to appear, or that other components can co-evolve, or that new components can emerge. And it's the genesis of these new components that enables, enables uh, new user needs that creates future source of value. So the evolution of one, components, uh, of one component and its efficient provision enables the innovation of others. As we have seen in the video clip at the beginning is that competitor actions will change the game. So with more competitors turning up targeting the smartphone market, the landscape has changed and software and mobile phones became increasingly important than in the previous cell phone era. And also as demonstrated in the clip, um, um, there's something that holds you back from evolving components and that is inertia to change created by past success. So in the inertia increases, the more successful the past model has been. And so also inertia can kill an organization. So due to Nokia's inertia to change, the market value declined by about 90% in just six years. With the understanding of the landscape and the climatic patterns acting on it, next is doctrine. And the doctrine is describing universal basic principles that are applicable to all industries, regardless of the context. And these are techniques um, that you as an organization should apply. And it's about your organizational fitness, um, how you can deal with strategic concerns. So let's go through some uh, doctrine principles. The first one is um, know your users, know who your users are, for example, your customers, shareholders, staff, business partners, and so on. Focus on the user need. Um, so the user need are the um, subject area for what we build software. They are the why, the purpose of our business domain, and they are the anchor of our map. Um, know the details in terms of what components and activities are required to fulfill the user needs. And also challenge assumptions by sharing this map and discuss it with others with a focus on creating a new better map and also create a, create a better understanding. And people with different skill set work together in order to create a common understanding. And uh, for that, uh, you need to use a common language because this, uh, using a common language is necessary for an effective communication. Another principle is to use appropriate methods um, per evolution state. So build components in Genesis and custom build in-house, um, preferably using agile methods. Use or buy off the shelf products or open source software for components and activities in the product and rental evolution stage with preferably lean methods. Or outsource components in commodity uh, to utility supplier using preferably Six Sigma method. Another principle is to think, is to think small um, as in contracts. So break large land landscapes into smaller contracts and try to minimize crossing the stages of evolution in a contract. Think small also as in teams, like everything must be broken down into small teams. And um, the team size itself, it's, it's limited by the Dunbar number. That's the number, uh, limit of number of people with um, whom can maintain stable social relationships. 
I think aptitude and attitude. Uh, so it's not only the skill set, the aptitude, um, which is relevant, but also um, the mindset for the team members, such as pioneers who are dealing with constantly changing, undefined market, and are very happy with exploration, experimenting, uncertainties, and failures. Or settlers, um, they are dealing with maturing products from the, um, from the pioneers and growing markets and are very happy with constant improvements, market analysis and feedback. Or the town planners that are dealing with well-defined, uh, standardized and stable mature markets and they are happy with operational efficiencies, um, analytics, um, scientific modeling and building what is needed. Uh, the next step of our strategy cycle is the leadership and it's about the strategy you choose considering your landscape, the climate and your capabilities. Once you have laid out your map, multiple points of um, action are showing up which have potentials where to move or what posi position you might abandon. And give your purpose, the landscape, the climate and your doctrine, you, now you can make an informed decision about which strategy is appropriate for the context. So <clears throat> Wattle Maps is a um, visual and context-specific uh, context um, framework for designing and evolving strategies based on uh, your situal awareness and movement and focusing on the evolutionary flow. And the next perspective I would like to bring in is to build adaptive systems is the software architecture perspective with domain-driven design. Domain-driven design is about designing software based on domain models, first proposed by Eric Evans. And um, domain-driven design comes with a core statement. Um, in order to build better software, we have to align its software design with the business domain, the business needs, and the business strategy. And domain-driven design helps us to apply uh, doctrine principles as well. But Domain-driven design comes with a lot new of, of new terms and um, that requires some time to grasp and to understand. So when starting the journey to domain-driven design, it could be quite overwhelming. And today I would also like to, to visualize the journey to domain-driven design with what limits. So before we develop a solution that solves the user needs, we have to understand the problem domain first. And that's where um, domain-driven design comes in, where the collaboration between uh, the domain experts and development teams is an essential part to analyze the problem domain to obtain domain knowledge. And this domain knowledge is described in terms of the shared language, the ubiquitous language. And domain-driven designs comes with patterns and practices, and these uh, are component of strategic and tactical design. And when we enter the field of strategic and tactical design, I would like to combine it with water maps and use, uh, use the, the y-axis to plot the position in the value chain. So going from, from top, the strategic design patterns to further down to the tactical design patterns. So we start at the top um, with the, um, in the problem space of strategic design, and that's where we analyze the problem domain and discover subdomains. As a next step, we go further down and switch to the solution space of strategic design. That's where we do high level design decisions and decompose our system into modular components, the bounded contexts, and map the interaction patterns between them, the context maps. Further down, we enter the tactical design patterns that um, support low level design decisions to architect an implementation that fits the problem domain as closely as possible and that provides building blocks to implement the, uh, the domain model. So when distilling the problem domain, we are partitioning the problem domain into smaller subdomains, um, a set of interrelated use cases or business processes. And by partitioning the problem domain into smaller subdomains, we are reducing complexity. But um, not all subdomains are equal. So some of them are more valuable to the business than the others. So we have different types of subdomains. We have the core, the supporting and the generic subdomain. The core subdomain, that is the essential part of our problem domain and providing competitive advantage. Um, that are those parts of the system that make it a success. 
And they, the, the um, core subdomain, they, it should be hard for competitors to copy or imitate. So they're supposed to be quite complex and they um, tend to change often. And that's where we have to strategically invest in most and innovate on. So that's the subdomain we need to build in-house. And this is supposed to go into the genesis and custom build evolution stage. The supporting subdomains, um, they help to, to support the core subdomains for, um, and they do not provide any competitive advantage. They are quite simple, they do not change often. And if possible, we should look out for um, buying off the shelf products or use open source software that goes then in the product and rental evolution stage. If that is not possible, and if we have to custom build the supporting subdomain, we should not invest heavily in that part of the system. The generic subdomains are subdomains that many large business systems have, for example, um, authentication, authorization, or payment services. So they are in core and provide no competitive advantage, but businesses cannot work without them. They are generally complex, but already solved by someone else. So for the generic subdomain, we should focus on buying off-the-shelf products or open source software or outsource to commodity suppliers. So there's no need for innovation here. So when going further down, we are switching to the um, solu solution space of strategic design and uh, where we decompose our system into modular, modular components, the bounded context. A bounded context forms a boundary around a domain model. And so let's look first at domain models before we go into the bounded context. Within each subdomain, a domain model can be created, representing the domain logic and business rules that are relevant um, for that area of the system. And the domain model comes in different shapes. Um, the domain model is first formed as an analysis model um, during the collaboration between the domain experts and development team and can result later in, in the tactical design area, area in a code model. And which is very crucial is that this domain model is described in terms of ubiquitous language and is free of technical complexities. But a domain model cannot exist without a boundary and that's where we come to the bounded context. Um, a bounded context can provide different types of boundaries. So it forms a consistency boundary around the domain model and protect, protects its integrity. It also forms a linguistic and semantic boundary so that um, the language's terms are only consistent inside the bounded context. It also serves as an ownership boundary. So a bounded context um, should be implemented, evolved and maintained by one team only. However, um, a single key, a team can, can own multiple bounded contexts. A bounded context serves also as a physical boundary and can be implemented as separate solutions. And not all bounded contexts need to share the same architecture patterns. Uh, they could differ for, for every bounded context. And also um, um, the business logic implementation um, uh, can also differ from context to context. And bounded contexts in general um, are representing good candidates for microservices. So the um, strategic design of domain-driven design helps us to apply the universal principles of Wardley's doctrine. So at the center of domain-driven design, we have the close collaboration between uh, the domain experts and the development teams and um, to support analyzing the business domain. And that lets us to challenge the assumption. And through the collaboration um, between the domain experts and the development teams, we are gaining domain knowledge. And this let us get the details of the business domain. And this domain knowledge, knowledge is free of technical terms. Instead, it's described in terms of the shared language, um, the ubiquitous language. And this enables us to use common language. With domain-driven design, we are partitioning our problem domain into smaller subdomains, um, but not all subdomains are equal. So some of them are more valuable than others. And the core subdomain, that's the one that provides competitive advantage where we have to strategically invest in most. And um, discovering the core subdomain, let us focus on high situational awareness and understand the, uh, the, uh, the landscape we are operating and competing in. And decomposing our system into modular components, um, the bounded context, 
enables us to partition our landscape into smaller contracts. And uh, since domain-driven design suits best for the core subdomain reflecting complex behavior, we are not applying every uh, domain-driven design, at least the tactical design patterns everywhere. So this lets us use appropriate methods per um, subdomain. So after all the theory, um, let's now go into uh, to create an example. So let's design a software as a service conference management solution that helps organizers of a conference to manage their call for papers. So what users are we targeting? Um, so we have the organize of, organizer of a conference at the one side and then the speakers of the, on the other side. And what are their user needs? Um, so um, the conference organizer would like to manage an event to call a CFP, a call um, to start a, CFP, a call for papers. And the speaker would like to uh, submit a session proposal to this call for paper that then um, the organizer can um, start to evaluate the submitted sessions and build and uh, publish the schedule of the accepted sessions and communicate with the speakers um, during the, um, the preparation of the conference. And both of them would like to sign in and sign up into that conference management solution. As a next step, we are going down uh, to decompose the problem domain into smaller subdomains and discovering the core uh, subdomain, for example, based on a vision statement or collaborating with the stakeholders. And the core subdomain is strategically very important and that's where we should invest and innovate. So after um, analyzing the business domain and um, and discovering the subdomains, uh, we had some knowledge crunching session with the domain experts and we were able to gain some domain knowledge and derived our first domain model, model, models uh, of the subdomains. And um, these domain models represent at this stage um, the analyzers models and they could be UML uh, diagrams or product sketches or wireframes and so on. And what's important is that they are free of technical concerns and they are described in our shared language, the ubiquitous language. But we have noticed that we derived some domain models that are used at different places of our systems. So for example, we have sessions, speakers and CFP call for papers that relate to multiple other domain models. But a session proposal that have been submitted during this um, call for papers has different attributes and rules than session that has been scheduled for the agenda. So for uh, the agenda or schedule, time slot and room are relevant and we have to make sure that we are not scheduling a session twice. But room and time slot uh, and the um, double scheduling of a um, session um, to check this is not relevant for the session submission, neither for the session evaluation. To keep the consistency and the integrity of our domain models, um, we need to adjust our ubiquitous language. And we are now talking of submitted sessions, scheduled sessions and evaluated sessions. And this is a strong indicator that we need to place the boundary around our models. Um, the bounded context and to keep the meaning of our models consistent and clear. So these bounded contexts form a linguistic and semantic boundary and protects the integrity of our models. As mentioned earlier, bounded context enables ownership boundaries. Uh, so one bounded context should be owned by one team only, but one team can own several bounded contexts. And this enables autonomous teams working at their bounded context independently at their own pace uh, with minimal impact across other teams. Bounded contexts also serve as um, physical boundaries, uh, so they can be implemented as separate solutions and can be deployed independently as separate artifacts. Um, bounded contexts also enable to have separate data stores, which are not accessible by other bounded contexts. And um, the source code also can of each bounded context can be maintained into separate um, in separate Git repositories with their own CI CD pipeline. Each bounded context can have um, separate architecture patterns applied, and that's where we enter the tactical design area. 
For example, um, one bounded context can go with the layered architecture where we split our source code into layers such as presentation, business logic, and persistence layer. Or as hexagonal architecture, um, a specific, fo specific form of our layered architecture, which is also called um, ports and adapters. And this aims for separation of concerns, creating loosely coupled software components that can be easily connected to their software environment by using ports and adapters. Or we can use CQRS um, command query responsibility segregation, um, where, we, where this enables us to use different models to update information and to read information. So not only architectural patterns can be applied different per context, um, we can also apply different business logic implementation patterns. So each bounded context can be implemented differently. For example, as a domain model, which it's with its building blocks of aggregates, entities, value objects, and so on. And the domain model copes with cases of um, complex business logic and business rule. And this is very well suited for implementing the core subdomain or as active records. Um, active records, they are representing a row in a database table and they encapsulate um, the database access and adds domain logic uh, to the data. And so it carries both the data, the behavior and the access to the database. And um, access records, they are um, support cases where the business logic is quite simple, but um, um, requires to operate a more complex data structure. So it's usable for the supporting subdomain in case we have to custom build it. And transaction script organize, organizes business logic by procedures where each procedure hang, handles um, a single request from the presentation. And transaction scripts, they work well with small applications that doesn't implement any complex logic. So as mentioned earlier, the domain model co copes with cases of complex business logic, with complicated business rules, and um, um, provides some, some building blocks. So on the one side, we have uh, uh, the, the value object that can be identified by its values and are immutable. So changing the value of a value object will lead to a new object instance. Then we also have entities. They can be identified by its unique ID and its uh, its state can change over the time. And um, we are talking also about uh, aggregates that are composed of entities and, and values, and they represent a hierarchy of objects and, and draw a clear consistency and transactional boundary. And we also have uh, the uh, repository that saves and retrieves entities or aggregates from the underlying storing mechanism. And also the application service as a um, building block and they only orchestrate use cases and manage transaction and they do not contain any business logic. They are just the client of our domain model. Or the domain event, which is a message um, that describes a significant event that has happened in our business domain. Since domain-driven design focuses on areas with complex business logic, um, the domain-driven design is not applicable everywhere in our system. So we need to focus on our core domain since that's the one that's supposed to be quite complex, since that's the one that gives us competitive advantage. And the core subdomain is the subdomain we should implement as domain models. Um, the supporting and generic subdomains could go with um, architecture and business logic implementation patterns that are more suited for simpler subdomains, or we can use or buy off-the-shelf products or outsource to utility suppliers. So um, we have applied strategic and tactical design patterns of domain-driven design supporting the doctrine principles of a Wardley map, but we have not completed our value chain yet. So we are missing uh, the infrastructure components and um, each of the <clears throat> listed uh, bounded contexts um, uh, need some sort of, of, of data storage to store the state of their domain models. And, during session evaluation, schedule management, uh, we might want to search for speakers or filtering sessions by topic. For that purpose, we uh, need a search engine that facilitate the services or the bounded context of session evaluation and schedule management. And our um, 
our bounded contacts, our services of our bounded contacts are going to communicate asynchronously uh, via messages. And for that reason, we need a message broker. And each of the services or bounded contacts, including search engine, um, message broker, and data storage, they need an environment in which their software is executed, the compute platform. And this compute platform is running on top of a virtual machine. And we have decided to use open source software um, um, for our infrastructure components that goes then, this open software solutions goes then into the product and rental evolution stage. And um, then also uh, running on a cloud hostel, uh, cloud hosted virtual machine, which goes into the commodity evolution stage. <clears throat> and as the next step, uh, we are applying the principle of think small as in contracts. And um, we are to do this, to, to break our landscape into smaller contracts. We are using on the one hand, the bounded contexts as uh, separate contracts and the infrastructure components grouped by open source and cloud products as separate contracts. Now we are bringing in the team aspect as assigning um, teams to our identified uh, separate contracts. And consider also the aptitude and attitude principle um, that I've um, introduced earlier to address the mindset of pioneers, settlers, and town planners. And this brings us um, to the next perspective of team organization with team topologies. So what I meant doctrines is addressing team related uh, principles such as um, think small as in teams and reflecting aptitude and attitude. And with team topologies, uh, we can apply the, uh, those doctrine principles, including team evolution that optimize for fast flow of change. Um, Matthew Skelton and Emmanuel Pais published the book Team Topologies in 2019 and, um, and described team topologies um, as an approach that advocates for organizational design for flow of change and feedback from running systems. In some traditional organization, we still encounter a stepwise sequence with functional silos. But this stepwise sequence of changes, usually with separate functional silos division for each stage, handling over the work um, to the next team is not optimized for flow. This requires a lot of coordination effort, introduces bottlenecks, and there is no information flowing back from the live system into the teams that are developing the software. To optimize for flow of change, um, we need to avoid functional silos. Instead, we need to aim for autonomous um, cross-functional teams that are um, designing, developing, testing, deploying, and operating their system they are responsible for. And we also should avoid handovers. So hand, uh, the work should ne never be handed off to another team for a later stage of flow. And we need to use small long-lived teams as a standard and um, the team needs to own the system or subsystem they are responsible for. And also if the cognitive load of a team is largely exceeded, it becomes a delivery bottleneck. So it's, it's leading to delays, quality issues, or also a decrease in the team members' motivation. So we have to focus on minimizing the cognitive load of teams. And while the communication within the team is, is highly desired, um, we have to restrict a high bandwidth communication between the teams to enable um, the fast flow. And team topologies comes with the statement um, that building and running software systems can be achieved um, by using four team types and three interaction types. So let's go first to um, the team types and start with stream-aligned teams. Um, stream-aligned teams are allowed, uh, aligned to um, a continuous stream of work um, of a specific business domain or um, organizational capability. And um, the stream-aligned teams, they have end-to-end -end responsibility for building, um, deploying, running, supporting, also retiring that stream of work. And a stream of work um, could be um, a product, a service, a set of features, user journeys, and so on. And so the Streamaligned team, they aim to produce a steady flow of feature deliveries and also incorporating feedback from the, um, um, the latest release. The Streamaligned teams are 
autonomous um, cross-functional teams with a mix of generalists and also a few specialists. The next team type is uh, the platform teams. They are responsible for platforms that um, usually affect the way um, infrastructure and networking concerns or um, cross-cutting capabilities. And they provide uh, internal self-service services or tools um, for using that platform that then the streamline team can easily consume. So the platform team, they enable the autonomy of streamline teams and reduce their cognitive load. The enabling team help the streamline team to um, uh, acquire missing capabilities to upskill the streamline teams. And um, they could make um, suggestions on tooling, practices, uh, frameworks, or, uh, or can also set up a template for um, a deployment pipeline or um, basic test frameworks. And the, the, goal, uh, the goal of the enabling team is to increase uh, the autonomy of streamlined teams and reduce their cognitive load. Then we also have the complicated subsystem team. So they are supporting the streamlined teams on particularly complicated subsystems that uh, require specialized knowledge. And so a complica complicated subsystem could be um, video processing coding, uh, codec, um, um, mathematical model, a face recognition engine, and so on. And um, their team, uh, their aim is also um, to reduce the cognitive load and the, um, of the streamline team and working on systems um, that use the complicated subsystem. And so the streamline team is focusing on the flow of change and aims to produce a steady flow of feature deliveries. And to be able to do this, um, it needs help from the other team types that, and they, the other team types, they aim for increasing the autonomy and reducing the cognitive load of the streamlined teams. And um, so, but range teams into the before mentioned ty team types, that is not enough to become effective. Um, however, these teams have to interact with each other and we have to know when to change and evolve this team interaction. So we have the interaction type of collaboration. Um, this is with collaboration teams are working very closely together. And um, the collaboration is very suitable for rapid discovery uh, and innovation, for example, when um, exploring new technologies. Or X as a service suits very well when one team needs to use a code library, a component, an API or platform um, that can be effectively provided by another team as a service. And uh, this interaction types, uh, type works best where um, predictable delivery is needed. Um, facilitating this interaction type comes into play when uh, one team uh, would benefit from active help of another team and to enhance the productivity and the effectiveness, uh, effectiveness and also um, the flow of the help receiving team. So the combination of um, well-defined team types and well-defined uh, interactions promotes organizational effectiveness. And there are also typical uses of interactions between these types. So collaboration is typical for streamlined teams, uh, collaborating or working closely together with um, platform or complicated subsystems for a specific period of time, but also platform uh, uh, teams and complicated subsystem teams can work closely together for a limited time. Then access the service, uh, streamlined teams and complicated subsystem teams um, um, can consume a platform as a service from a platform team or a component or library as a service from a complicated subsystem team. And uh, facilitating uh, this is the common uh, typical interaction type for enabling teams, helping a streamlined team, complicated subsystem team, or a platform team. Or these other three can also help another streamlined team by facilitating it. So the combination of the four fundamental team topologies and uh, with its interaction types help to apply um, the doctrine um, principles of Wardler map in terms of like, Think small as in teams, optimize for flow, provide purpose, mastery, and autonomy, 
and also to design for constant evolution. So where changes could flow through the organization without the need for constant restructuring. <clears throat> so when we go back to our water maps, we can now place the team types there as well by assigning the stream aligned teams to the bounded context and also the platform teams to the infrastructure components, uh, subdivided into um, platform team for open source components and for co cloud components. And depending on the complexity and its resulting cognitive load, um, the stream aligned teams could be assigned to more than one bounded context. But one bounded context, as mentioned before, cannot be shared among multiple teams. So, we have met our landscape uh, we are operating in, understood the climatic patterns impacting our landscape, applied um, doctrine principles with domain-driven design and team topologies. And uh, now we would like to know um, where to move next and to increase our organizational effectiveness, for example, increasing software delivery performance. And on our map, we have identified op opportunities to, for example, um, to move our current open source components, compute platform and the virtual machine to commodity by using cloud and serverless technology solely to get our infrastructure fully managed by cloud providers. To execute this transition, we're doing a team first approach. So as a first step, we could convert our separate platform teams into one cloud platform team. That collaborates closely with one of the uh, streamlined teams for rapid discovery of the new serverless technology um, yeah, for, for a limited time. And as soon as the new serverless uh, technology is better understood through discovery, they go to, limited, um, to the limited collaboration mode. And this evolves to uh, X as a service uh, once the serverless technology is more established in the organization. The cloud platform team can also facilitate um, other streamlined teams, for example, by coaching, the, coaching them um, how to use the new build pipeline in a serverless ecosystem. And uh, the streamlined team that was previously collaborating closely together with the platform team to discover the new serverless technology stack, they can now facilitate the other streamlined teams to coach them about practices to implement serverless functions um, by, for example, modifying the ports and adapters of our hexagonal architecture. So with serverless, the entire infrastructure, infrastructure is now fully managed. So we can move the components uh, from the previous product and rental evolution stage to the commodity evolution stage. And our team structure and um, software architecture can gracefully absorb, absorb that transition to serverless. So the purpose, the landscape, um, the climatic patterns and uh, the doctrine principles of water maps enables us to make an informed decision about which strategy is appropriate for our context and how is our landscape potentially changing and where to move to, ab to adapt those changes. With, um, and domain driven design and team topologies, they help us to apply the doctrine principles making our software architecture and team organization fit for easily um, yeah, absorbing those changes. So in summary, uh, the combination of Wattler maps, domain-driven design and team topologies provides a very powerful tool set to design um, and build and evolve adaptive systems and team structures for fast flow of change. So at the end, I would like to provide some resources that you can use uh, to dive deeper into the topic I've mentioned earlier. And at the end, let me thank you all for attending my talk and I'm looking forward um, to your questions in this Slack channel. <laughs>